The following program is brought to you by Caltech. I'm Sam Foster. I'm the vice president of the Caltech Alumni Association, and I am your host for the second half of today. So welcome. Go Caltech alumni. Um, woo! Yes, feel free to clap. Come on. We're awesome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is being taped. Um, okay, so I'm really pleased to introduce our next speaker, Joel Burdick. I, when I was an undergrad, I took classes from Professor Burdick. Thank you. I did. <laughs> Thank you very much for teaching me. Um, so, uh, pardon? She was an excellent student. Yeah, he's lying. Um, <laughs> So, doc <laughs> so, so I, have, I have script, but clearly it's not going very well. Um, so Dr. Burdick was the recipient of the NSF uh, Presidential Young Investigator Award. Uh, that was a long time ago. Not Whatever. Yet, we're, come on, come on. We're, we're ramping this up. Um, he also uh, has a Feynman Fellowship. He won the best paper for the IEEE International Conference in Robotics and Automation for a couple years, 1993, 1999, 2000, and 2005. He was appointed the IEEE Robotics Society Distinguished Lecturer in 2003 and received the Popular Mechanics Breakthrough Award in 2011. His research are mainly in the area of robotics and as we'll hear now on spinal cord injuries, um, as well as multiple fingered robotic grasping and sensor-based sensor robotic planning motion, robotic motion planning, sorry. Um, he received his undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering from Duke and his master's and PhD in mechanical engineering from Stanford. I'm super excited. Joel Burdick, thank you so much for talking to us at Alumni College. Let's welcome Joel Burdick. Great, thanks for being here. So if you don't know me, I'm a mechanical engineer. So you can tell because I, my backup technology is this wooden stick. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I'm also in control and dynamical systems and now a faculty affiliate of our medical engineering and bioengineering and CNS programs as well. So uh, as I said, um, I started working with Reggie Edgerton. Um, then we started including uh, Yuri in Russia uh, and then now uh, where we do our human work initially at the University of Louisville, you say today. And then now we're actually doing work, human work here um, at UCLA with a neurosurgeon named Dan Liu. So I'm the messenger for sort of a big team. This is all my work. Uh, what I wanna talk about now is a broad overview of what we're trying to do uh, and then talk about a few technical details from the engineering side. So all of you know um, that um, your brain is connected up to your muscles. And uh, when that sort of becomes damage, um, then you are potentially paralyzed, which is why um, about a million people in the US um, suffer from a loss of mobility uh, or loss of voluntary control of their muscles. And about 400 of these people have a loss of muscle control that's severe enough to be in wheelchairs or to impact their sort of daily life. So there's about 11,000 new uh, cases per year, and of these um, 400,000, 50% of them are what we call a complete injury. So a complete injury means below the level of the injury, there's actually no sensation, no motor control whatsoever. So these are the most severe spinal cord injury, uh, injuries uh, possible, and those are the ones we're most interested in, uh, because for the incomplete injuries, progress is being made, uh, but for uh, complete injuries, time has kind of stood still. And um, there's actually huge uh, societal as well as economic benefits for trying to uh, work with this cohort of people. So um, the typical spinal cord patient, the median age in the US is 28. Uh, and so the typical person lives for 40 years with their spinal cord injury. And so over that time, they rack up a huge number of extra medical costs. Typically, uh, actually these numbers are low, um, actually about two and a half million dollars per patient uh, extra over their lifetime. And that's because unless you know someone with a spinal cord injury, you may not be aware that loss of mobility is actually not their top problem. So in fact, the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation about 10 years ago surveyed thousands of spinal cord patients and asked them, if you could have back five things, what would they be? Standing and walking was not top. There was only fourth for most of them. Um, and that's because most spinal cord patients have to use a catheter. And so uh, because of the complications, spinal cord patients die at a rate 11 times the general population from bladder complications. Um, they also uh, have to spend 60 to 90 minutes a day extra managing their bowel uh, compared to normal healthy subjects. Um, they typically have either huge blood pressure spikes or huge blood pressure dropouts. And so they have to take specialized medication um, to manage their blood pressure loss. And there's a whole host of other sort of conditions that happen that really impact them greatly sort of on a daily basis. 
And so uh, we're not the only team. So there's lots of teams around the world um, looking at this problem and motivated by not only the loss of mobility, but actually uh, oftentimes for these sort of secondary conditions, which are the most uh, critical, acute things they face day to day. Now, um, as I said, around the world, um, there are groups um, working on trying to manage uh, what happens right after the injury. So there's a very complex biochemical cascade after an injury, uh, which leads to a variety of different inflammatory responses in the nervous system. So not only do you have the mechanical damage to the nerves, um, you also can have this inflammatory response, which can cause additional damage. So new techniques in terms of surgery to relieve the pressures and drugs to slow down the inflammatory response are being worked on. Uh, and those are good, but um, there's still going to be a large number of people who are left with a major injury because of the severity of the uh, accidents or things they get into. So to try to reconnect the brain down to the lower spinal cord um, after the injury, people were working on stem cells, um, transplanting uh, tissue cultures of neural tissue, um, also genetic manipulation. So when you cut your finger, the peripheral nervous system actually will regrow neurons to inc incorporate new sensation, but the central nervous system doesn't. So people are now trying to trick the central nervous system into thinking it's a peripheral nerve. So all these things are good, and these are the right long-term uh, solutions. The problem is it's really long term. Um, they're still kind of in petri dishes. They're not really getting out uh, into clinical practice yet. There's been just recently the first sort of stem cell studies um, in human spinal cord patients, and the study's not even over yet, so we don't even know how well they're working yet. So uh, because, again, our focus on the complete spinal cord injury uh, is until these things are solved, really the standard of care for complete injured subjects right now is manage all the side effects that I told you about, uh, put them in a wheelchair, and try to have them adapt as best as possible to their new life circumstances. So um, what our team's been working on is um, an alternative approach based on the following concept. So when you get up from this uh, seminar today, or like say tonight when you're standing around at a cocktail party or outside talking to your friend, uh, what you may not realize is that your brain's really not that much involved in your postural control. There's specialized circuitry in your lower spinal cord that actually sort of takes high level commands from the brain and coordinates all the muscle input and sensory input um, to the lower spinal cord, which makes the decisions how to move the muscles on an instant by instant basis to uh, follow the high level goals that your brain sets. Likewise, when you're walking down the path later today talking to a colleague, um, actually the generate, generating the rhythms and controlling most of your muscle activity is done in your lower spinal cord. The brain's actually not heavily involved in those repetitive motions. Now doing highly gymnastic things or, or things like tennis, whatever, where you have to think about each move, yes, the brain's highly involved. So, but for these sort of very simple motions, uh, one possibility that we're looking at is that um, after a spinal cord injury, the brain can no longer turn on this circuitry in the lower spinal cord, but what we can potentially do is come in from the outside and try to tap into the circuitry down here. Um, and so that's um, what our teams are working on for the last dozen years, uh, is figuring out how we can tap into the circuitry and kind of trick the lower spinal cord to thinking that it's standing at a cocktail party or walking down a, a flat hallway um, so that the patients can engage in some simple activities. Uh, again, studies have shown that one of the highest priorities for complete spinal cord patients is just the ability to stand so they can do the dishes at home, be engaged uh, in a cocktail party conversation, or do other things like that is a big psychological boost, um, as well as a health boost. Getting up standing um, actually helps a cardiovascular system uh, to maintain its homeostasis and to keep all the valves in the, in the uh, pathways uh, sort of working. So um, here's kind of how we do it. Um, it's a threefold story, so after this you can go to sleep, because now you know all my secrets. Um, and, uh, but I'm going to now sort of articulate and sort of tell you kind of chronologically the story of how we developed this approach. So uh, the sexy part of what we do is we develop specialized electrodes that we implant uh, along the spinal cord in what's called the epidural space. So inside your vertebral canal, but outside your spinal cord, there's a little space between the bone and then what's called the dura, uh, which is the thick membrane that covers all your central nervous system and prevents infections from getting in there. So normally that space is filled with a little bit of fat, so we dig the fat out of there and stick electrodes down in there um, so that we have, in effect, a phased array radar on the lower spinal cord so we can talk to this circuitry and try to get it going again. Um, 
The second thing we do is we have to actually train the patients how to learn to use our electrode array. Uh, because the lower spinal cord uh, you know, grew up speaking Italian, uh, and now we put this array in there that's shouting German at it, and so it has to figure out how to use this. And the simplest way is to actually just go through lots of physical training with the electrode. And because I'm an old robot guy, we build robots to help sort of do this training and to help monitor the patients as well. And the final one, which I'm not going to talk much about today, is uh, we also use some drug therapy that goes along with this. So after um, a spinal cord injury, there are certain key neurotransmitters synthesized in your brain transported down the spinal cord, um, and these are uh, lost after a spinal cord injury, and so we have to kind of replace them and replace their effect. So this is the, when I first got started in this. So this is where we started about 10 years ago. So Reggie and I were first looking at sort of two of these three components. We actually hadn't figured out the electrode array parts. And so we were looking at, well, could we actually um, drug the lower spinal cord to excite it again, um, to get it going, and then basically train in a response so that animals or humans, essentially once they got a little sensory input, they could actually start doing some basic function. And so I apologize, these are, um, this, in this case, mice. that We actually completely transect their spinal cord. Uh, we actually place plastic between both halves so we know the brain can't be connected to the lower spinal cord. And so every day, we would give them a drug called quipazine, uh, which in effect replaces the lost serotonin uh, that can no longer be transported down the spinal cord, and then we train them every day. So um, this is this animal uh, we drug every day and train it every day for twi 20 minutes a day, twice a day. After one week after his spinal cord is transected, not much is happening, all right? But after, uh, yeah, after four weeks, you actually start to um, see recovery of some basic function there. And um, after about six weeks, we can actually train in um, an actual sort of bona fide stepping. Now, it can't fully support its weight, and it's actually not useful uh, because animals which are trained to step cannot stand. Animals which are trained to stand cannot step. So you can train in one little trick so that once it gets to sensory input, it sort of just does some basic function like a, a re reflex. Um, and so it, it wasn't that useful. So we were looking around. Uh, we knew that we had to sort of tap into the spinal cord. And so at that point, um, we knew about some work in Russia. So in Russia, they can do things we can't do here. Um, and so um, <laughs> our uh, colleague, Yuri Gerasimenko, uh, is a neuroscientist there and also a consultant to the uh, Russian Olympic team. So he has lots of volunteers. And um, so there is a, an old literature in, in uh, Russia on what's called epidural stimulation, which is the primary technique that we use. And so Yuri came over uh, and showed us actually how we could crudely do epidural stimulation. So they can do things there that we can't do, but we have technology there here that they don't have there. Uh, so it was a good marriage. And so um, Yuri came over and just with uh, using drugs every day, using my little robots, and then putting just two wires in the lower spinal cord, um, this is a, a rat one week after its spinal cord's been transected, uh, it's able to sort of step normally. And now, it's not just a one trick pony. Uh, what happens now is if you reverse the treadmill, um, it'll actually start stepping backwards. So the decision to actually do that reversal actually is largely in your lower spinal cord. It's actually not in your brain. And so in fact, uh, when you um, move the animal sideways, it'll even sideways step. And again, we've totally disconnected the brain of this um, animal um, from, <coughs> Um, its lower spinal cord. So uh, we knew we were onto something, so now we wanted to figure out, could we optimize this? And um, even though this works in rats, it also had been shown uh, in cats, uh, would it actually work in humans? So the first thing we did is we brought in then Yu Chong Tai, um, who's a micromachine expert here at Caltech, and I've been working with Yu Chong Tai on other neural, face, neural interface projects with Richard Anderson here. And so YC had been working actually on some um, implants for retinas, for uh, retinal prosthetics or blindness, and so when I saw this technology, I said, hey, we can adapt that. We'll just treat the spinal cord like a retina uh, and basically put a bunch of pixels all over the spinal cord um, so that we can actually stimulate things. And so this is, I won't bore you with many generations of technology and suffering that grad students had to go through. Um, this is sort of where our current arrays look like. So this is about two and a half millimeters across, scaled for a rat. Um, this is a couple centimeters long. There's 27 individual electrodes which look like this. This shape is complicated to minimize cell adhesion and a bunch of other sort of issues um, to get this to survive in an animal. And so uh, obviously you fabricate these arrays and then we attach them to um, implantable electronics which we then implant inside the animal. Uh, and then the array part which is then, uh, we take off a half a vertebra above the locomotion circuitry and a half of a vertebra below the locomotion circuitry and we basically thread this long thin tape down there. 
So I said, this is about two and a half millimeters wide. It's only 20 microns thick. If you don't think metric, that's a thousandth of an inch. So it's very thin and flexible. So it's air very easy to place in the epidural space, even in a small animal, and then suture it down. And so the um, reason we went to this is because I'm a simple-minded engineer. And so if Yuri's two electrodes were good as an engineer, like, well, 27's got to be a lot better, right? And, and so uh, we sort of slowly sort of built up to we got that many. And the advantage then of have, having this sort of dense array um, is that now, um, what you'll see here is this is actually one of Yuri's rats on the uh, uh, left here. And with the array on, we can actually get uh, even better sort of stepping. And because we can now um, um, stimulate different areas of the cord at will, we can also go from standing or stepping, we can actually preferentially excite standing versus sort of stepping. Um, we can also steer the animal. So this animal is steered down the middle. This one you'll see is actually steered towards the right. So we can actually grab hold of the spinal cord. And again, these animals' uh, cords have been completely transected. So the brain cannot talk to the lower spinal cord. Uh, and so we can essentially uh, have these animals do things at will. And so the idea then is to connect these to an external computer um, and um, allow um, these animals and then eventually humans uh, to be able to be computer controlled uh, and doing simple tasks like standing and walking. So uh, the obvious question for us is, okay, we know this works in four-legged animals. Will it actually work in humans? Now, the technology that you saw on the previous slide is not ready yet for sort of human use. Um, so we looked around, and we actually found a technology out there which was FDA approved, which would allow us to actually simulate um, this general approach. So some of you may know, um, for people whose back pain is so severe that it can't be treated by drugs or surgery or chiropractic, um, a number of companies, this one's Medtronic, uh, make a package which you insert into the spinal cord. So this is an electrode array. S surprisingly, this is the best picture that Medtronic puts out. Uh, it's a crappy picture. Um, and, and this is what the array looks like. There's 16 individual electrodes. So you take this array and you implant it in the epidural space. That's just like we want to do. Uh, and then each of these electrodes, you can either choose to turn them off or on, and you can send pulses to them. And the way that you send these pulses is you also implant a battery pack uh, inside there. And this battery pack has both a wireless charging as well as wireless remote control, so you can turn the array off and on and sort of tune some of these parameters. So you can tune how fast you stimulate, how big amplitude you stimulate, and how wide each of the pulses is. This is actually a CT scan from Rob Summers, our first actual patient on the day of his surgery. Um, now, normally, um, for back pain, you sort of pay, place these electrode arrays up here where the pain is related and stimulate at about 200 to 1,000 hertz. At that high frequency, you actually deaden the nerves in the upper spinal cord. We place it down here over the locomotion circuitry and use a low frequency, which you can then do mathematically a proof that shows that it excites the nerves down there, which is what we want to do. We want to get those nerves going and then retune them so they can do something useful. So as I said, our first patient was a guy named Rob Summer. He's an amazing guy. Whenever I feel like unmotivated, I just think of Rob. This guy has motivation like you can't believe. So uh, unfortunately, uh, well, he was a tremendous athlete. So uh, three months before he was injured, he was the pitcher on the NCAA Division I National Champion Baseball team. Um, so he was an incredible athlete. And he also had a strong interest in physiology. So he actually knew all the muscle groups and all the nerves. And so he was a great patient because you could talk science with him. Um, in addition to him being uh, a great volunteer, he volunteered to be implanted uh, with this technology. So um, about three months after he won the national championship, he was hit and run by a car from behind and left to die on the road. And unfortunately, a postman found him about eight hours later um, and got him to the hospital. But he had a massive crust injury um, in the C6 to T1 area, which is about right here. Uh, and so from his armpits down, and even his hands initially were paralyzed, uh, he couldn't move a muscle. Uh, and so about um, two years after that happened, we started then training him in preparation for the implant. So the way our science works is if we train these patients every day doing something called locomotor training. Uh, this is now done in Louisville, which is the world sort of expert on this type of locomotor training. Sometimes patients will recover some function. Rob, after training every day for a year, recovered nothing. So we knew he was fundamentally paralyzed. So we knew then if we implanted the electrode array, whatever gains he got would be due to the electrode, not from sort of physical training. So he was implanted uh, about a little over uh, three, to three and a half years ago now. And um, <clears throat> so after the scars heal, um, the, we had a protocol where we then sort of check out the array for two days and see if it was okay. And so at the end of the second day, they brought him into the clinic in Louisville and they said, okay, Rob, we're going to turn the array on and see what happens. And he stood up first day, the first time. Um, and so he hadn't moved a muscle below this level for three years. And so here you see him standing just a couple of weeks um, after his sort of first training day. And so um, this is sort of what it looks like. This is about four months um, after his surgery. 
So in a typical training session, this is what's called a stand frame, um, and so he would wheel up in his wheelchair. Uh, as he gets close, the therapist here is starting to use the remote control to dial up the voltage, uh, and then the therapist help him stand up, uh, and this therapist is holding his legs, uh, and then once he's up in position, they'll do the final dial up to sort of get it to the level where um, <clears throat> standing uh, will work. So he has a little signal, he'll wiggle his body a little bit, says, okay, I feel the electrode working now, um, and so I'm ready to go, all right? So um, there he is sort of standing independently. You know, it's not perfect, and um, he needs some help um, with the stand frame initially, although there are long periods of time where he can stand without touching the stand frame as well. Um, and sort of this allowed him to sort of then uh, exercise every day. So to see what this is like, this is um, what are, are on here are both electrodes. We muscle, measure his muscle activity, and these markers here allow a camera to track his position. And so here is what's happening as the therapist dials up the uh, voltage while he's standing. At a certain point, we engage that circuitry in the lower spinal cord, and it thinks we're fooling it into thinking he's at a cocktail party. So it's now uh, given the signal to kind of stand, and so um, he's able to stand, and then he uses his upper body to kind of help balance himself because the normal vestibular ocular balance signals from the brain can't get down there. Um, and so uh, this was great, um, and so we continue to kind of train him every day, and um, several amazing things happened that we never anticipated. So first is, um, after about eight months before his uh, training, we did his oxygen uptake test. He was in the 50th percentile for his age group, which is not good for an elite athlete, but good for someone in a wheelchair. After eight months, because he was able to stand every day, he reached the 99th and a half percentile um, for his age group. Um, then a more amazing thing happened is after about five months, um, he started uh, reporting uh, that he was voiding his bladder a little bit. He was actually on a catheter like most patients with his severity. And then he eventually gained, regained, in effect, full bladder control. Uh, so he no longer uses a catheter. Um, his blood pressure became regular. He then went off all his blood pressure medications. He doesn't have quite full bowel control, but he only has to spend a few minutes a day rather than 90 minutes a day managing um, his bowel. And um, so all these things were great, so we were like, we never anticipated any of this, we just got lucky. Um, now, part of this is due to an exercise effect, and part of it is also the array happens to sit over some of the uh, sympathetic nervous system, which is related to the bladder and bowel. So we think by stimulating that, we help to recover some function. And he has the bladder and bowel control even without the stimulator on. So he only uses the stimulator during training sessions. Most of the day, it's sort of turned off. So um, Rob is a very mischievous guy. Um, and so about seven months um, after uh, training, once a month, he's laid down with all these instruments just to do a baseline check of all his muscles and electronics and stuff. So he turned to the therapist next to him and said, hey, I'm gonna spook Susie. Susie Harkman is the woman who leads the research at Louisville, and I'm gonna tell Susie I'm gonna move my toe. Um, and so she says, Susie, watch this. And she was like, what? He's like, I'm gonna move my toe. And he was just joking around. And all of a sudden, he moved his toe. Um, and um, so th they were all astounded. And so um, she said, holy, and I can't say what came next. Um, and she said, quick, get the camera turned on. And so this is the camera video about five minutes after that event happened. So what you'll see, he's actually able to move. Left ankle up. He can actually move Left in response to the commands. And um, so she was, he was, uh, so here we're actually tracking his motion. So with the stimulator turned off, these are what are called the EMGs or the muscle activity of all the main postural muscles. With the stimulator turned off, when she gives a verbal command here in this black bar, he can do nothing. So as soon as the stimulator is turned on, he actually can then make muscle commands in response to her voice, uh, time to this, and actually get voluntary control. So he practiced this, because he's an ambitious guy, and about a month later, um, as part of the protocol, we were working on step training anyway, uh, and so here he is about uh, eight months after his surgery. And um, so um, the technology which is approved by the FDA, we cannot tune it in the way that we know we need to from our animal studies to allow bilateral stepping. We can only tune it so he can step on one side at a time. So in this um, training session here, what you'll see is the right side um, is optimized, so he's able to, um, after a few warm-up steps, independently place his right side, and then the therapist is helping his left side, and then we switch. Um, and so he was able then to make these sort of voluntary motions. Now, again, you might ask as well, our whole theory was based on the idea that the brain's disconnected from the lower spinal cord. How is he doing this? And, and so um, it's clear that um, by stimulation, um, somehow we're actually able to allow the brain to reconnect with the lower spinal cord and to get a few signals through. They're not strong signals. There's many things he can't do, uh, but he actually has recovered a surprising amount of voluntary motion. So this is where he was about three years ago. Uh, and so since that time, 
Um, we even planted a number of other subjects. I can't tell you their names right now because uh, they haven't gone public. So we're actually on, now on four subjects um, that we've done. So the second patient uh, was what's known as what's called an Asia A, which is the worst kind of injury. So below the level of his injury, um, he couldn't feel nor move a muscle. He's a very funny guy. I'll tell you about him in a minute. Um, he was a dirt bike racer, semi-professional, and so one day in a practice, he flipped his motorcycle and broke his neck. Um, so this guy loves excitement. So in fact, even after he was paralyzed, he would duct tape himself to ATVs and go race. Uh, and so you would ask him, well, why would you do that? Why, aren't you worried about getting hurt? And it's like, well, I'm already paralyzed. Um, <laughs> and and so, um, so this is him about three months, uh, four months um, after his surgery. <clears throat> So he actually uh, was a very good voluntary controller. So as you see, he can actually move his legs up and down. And again, I want to emphasize is four months before that he couldn't move a muscle uh, below the level of his injury. So he was also our best stander as well. And um, so here's a little data from him. So um, what, this is his day uh, post sort of the first day of training. So this is right after scars healed day one. What's measured here in red is the amount of time he needed to rest during the stand training. What's measured in here in black is what we call independent standing, which means he's not even touching the frame. He's just standing completely on his own. The blue is total standing, whether it's using the balance bar or uh, independently on his own. And so what you see is after um, their, the first couple of days, these guys are exhausted. They take like four hour naps after we train them because they're just not used to, to doing this kind of stuff. And so you see within a couple of weeks, he actually was up to about an hour of standing. And then he started to go back down again. And so what happened was he was bored. Um, he got bored of standing. So again, this is a guy that tapes himself to ATVs. Uh, and so we actually had to play in, bring in music and video games while he was doing his training so he would just not fall asleep um, and, and be able to continue his training. Um, so our third patient was a motorcycle accident. Um, and so in a, a rec uh, again, to go back is um, our second patient actually stood the first day also. And he recovered voluntary control in four weeks, whereas Rob did it in seven months. Our third patient, uh, now seeing the first two, recovered voluntary motion in four days and stood on the first day. Our fourth patient um, recovered voluntary motion on the first day. Uh, we turned the array on. Um, he had a difficult time um, in standing, although we finally figured out. And so now he's a really good stander. And so a number of other things is recently the group in Louisville has figured out actually how to tune the array so they can do sit-ups now. Uh, and so this is a huge thing for spinal cord patients because normally they get distended abdomens because they have no voluntary control of those muscles. Uh, and so they're now, all four of them are doing sit-ups. And in fact, this guy two weeks ago actually went whitewater rafting um, with the array turned on. Um, so let me, um, and so a, a couple of messages which drive then sort of the engineering parts of what I work on are um, every patient's different. So the voltages we apply to the array differ by a factor of 10 from these patients. Uh, and their patterns different from each patient as to what's optimal for standing and stepping. And the patterns vary over time. Uh, and also, um, the gains continue well past one year. So Rob's almost four years into his training now. He still makes gains. So just last week, he's actually started moving his uh, toes voluntarily without the stimulator turned on. Uh, he's now doing sit-ups. Uh, he's doing de decent stepping on a treadmill. Uh, he can stand just fine. Um, and, and so he's doing great. And so um, one of the things that I work on, and I'm just going to give you a quick overview, is um, how do we uh, uh, tackle the fact that actually uh, each patient is sort of very different, and also that we have now technology to make incredibly complex arrays. So this is the array that we put in humans. Uh, this is the array, for example, we put in rats where there's 27 electrodes. And so if you just think about all the different combinations of voltages and frequencies and amplitudes that we can apply to these arrays, you're talking about billions of combinations of different parameters. So how do you efficiently sort of find those things? So um, one of the things that we do then is to uh, build uh, computational models um, of how these electrodes work. So we, in essence, make what are called volume conductor models, where we uh, make uh, components which are related to the different tissue types and put in the electrical properties of the different tissues in the spinal cord, and um, then lay in the electrodes. Uh, and then what we do is we uh, mesh up the space. And then uh, think back to your physics two. We saw Maxwell's equations uh, on this and sort of figure out actually how all the electric fields are sort of in currents or distributed in the spinal cord. And so we're using this now to kind of optimize the electro design and optimize the shape of the waveforms um, that go in there. But um, all of you who, who know that no model, uh, well, there's a famous quote, I forget who goes, um, um, 
no model is correct, but some are useful. Um, and so uh, we know these models aren't correct. And so another approach that we're taking actually is a kind of a machine learning approach. So we're trying to figure out a way to automatically tune the electrode array for each patient. And so the way this works, um, as you can imagine now, we have the electrode array. And so whether it's the human or the rat, we apply some stimuli to the rat. And so we have a set that we call D of the decision space of what stimuli we can apply. Then we actually measure um, the rat or the animal's kind of response. Uh, and then what we want to do is figure out, well, do we want to uh, now change the stimuli or use the same stimuli over again? And so this is called an active learning problem where we have to basically choose the next experiment and learn about the spinal cord at the same time. So we've been working with um, Andreas Krauss, who unfortunately left Caltech to solve a two-body problem with his wife in Europe. Uh, he was a machine learning <laughs> um, theorist. Um, and so we still work with Andreas, um, uh, even though he's in Europe, um, on this uh, technology. And so we've actually recently uh, tested this successfully in rats. And let me just kind of show you how this works. And, and so it turns out what's interesting is the theory behind this is the same theory behind gambling theory when you go to Las Vegas. So basically, you can think of the array as a slot machine. So we have to figure out which slot handle to pull, which is like which electrode combination to apply to the array to maximize our payoff, which is the patient you know, responding and, and working well. So this is a very complicated slide. This is the only technical slide in my talk today, and we're getting near the end. Um, and um, so what's going to be plotted along here is for a rat, again, whose spinal cord is completely transected, has our electrode arrays in it. And then um, every day, sort of post-injury, once we turn on the array, uh, what you'll see is the um, algorithm now is searching around. And each of the little dots that you see here is an actual experiment that the algorithm requests. So it chooses a stimuli and applies it to the rat. And the blue ones are the ones that uh, later we determined were the best arrays. And so what you're seeing is in the beginning, it's sort of searching all over. So what's plotted here is the performance of the animal under each of these stimuli. Each dot here corresponds to very different combinations of electrodes. But what you see over time is it can actually uh, increase the uh, performance of the animal. And it will also spend more and more time at the, what we figured out later were the optimal stimuli. So in fact, we did this experiment side by side where we actually had a human applying five stimuli and the machine applying the five stimuli. Across four animals, we beat the human every time. Um, and, and so, no, I'm, if anyone's a doctor in the room, I'm not putting you out of business yet. Uh, we just want to help you. Um, and uh, so uh, we've actually now turned this on in humans for a total of six days. We found that, uh, as you would expect, humans don't respond like rats. Said differently, humans complain when rats don't. Um, and so we're now having to uh, adapt this um, so we can make this comfortable for the humans. And so the goal then is, as we want to spread this technology out, uh, rather than needing a very highly tuned team, um, we can actually help unexperienced clinicians to be able to tune up these arrays for sort of each patient. Um, so one other thing that I work on as a personal hobby is actually now trying to um, also make this technology cheap and also be able to send patients home um, with things that they can use. So this is Rob, our first patient in the clinic. And so you can see normally during a training section, they have this big bulky stand frame because it's safe and a whole team of technicians. This is a $50,000 camera system pointed at him. This is a $200,000 EMG system uh, to measure his muscle activity. So you can imagine it's about, it's a, it's about $1,000 an hour of clinician time. Uh, and so each patient costs us about $400,000 uh, for one year of study. And then they go home, and so they want to continue their, study, their training at home. Uh, but we can't replace $400,000 equipment in their home while they're doing that. And so um, what I've been working on is also uh, again, it's just a personal hobby, is uh, building new stand frames. So this is the first one I built in my garage in December 2010 out of ABS plastic from Home Depot and a, and a hacksaw. Uh, and now we've been developing more sophisticated ones and actually using video game technology so we can actually track the humans inside the frame. And we're developing a novel foot sensor that only costs six bucks that actually can do about 80% of what the $200,000 EMG system can do. Um, so that we can send these things home with people and actually be able to monitor them remotely. The other one is a sad story is, um, everyone knows who works with the insurance companies, they don't, you know, there's no billing code for it, you can stand again. Um, and so you have to be able to gather data and convince them that it's cheaper to provide this technology than not to sort of train these, uh, or not to help these sort of people. So we're trying to get that um, to this point right now. So let me just conclude uh, and sort of say, um, you know, we believe we're starting to have a therapy, right? The cure is still a long way off. This just allows these patients a way to manage their health better uh, and, and than they've been able to do in the past. For these complete spinal cord patients, they haven't had any alternatives yet. Um, and so we are also have now started investigations. We've implanted one human at UCLA for upper body paralysis. 
Um, the results aren't so dramatic, but for upper body paralysis, anything you can do is a huge win for them. Um, we're also working on stroke patients. 40% of the 700,000 stroke patients in the US lose some motor function. And so not all of them, but some of them should be able to benefit from this technology. And we have preliminary data on that supports that. And we're now working on a crazy new electrode technology from our Russian friend. This is a very fun story. So again, Rush, Yuri is a consultant to the Russian Olympic team. And so one of the uh, Olympic trainers there working with the Cuban Olympic team uh, before the Berlin Wall fell um, developed this new stimulating unit that they would actually apply to the muscles of the high jumpers and the volleyball team. And they all gained about six inches extra of jumping by using the stimulator every day. And they didn't know theoretically, I've been able to show them theoretically why, they sort of found it, figured out intuitively how they could get insane amounts of current and voltage uh, into the muscles without harming them, without also causing pain. And so Yuri, our crazy Russian friend, tried it on a human on the spinal cord. And I've actually been able to model it and show that we can actually get significant electric fields down into the spinal cord from surface electrodes. So we've actually had five paralyzed patients actually now uh, demonstrate voluntary control using only surface electrodes. Uh, and we're working on this for stroke patients right now. And so uh, we're really excited about this technology. So it won't provide as good a control as the implanted electrodes, but it actually can be used for especially um, frail people who wouldn't be able to survive the surgery. Um, and so um, I want to just conclude by uh, thanking all of you for listening today and letting me uh, spend your tax dollars uh, on this great subject. Uh, we've also had some great support from a number of foundations. Uh, and, and again, I'm just a messenger for a big team. There's a huge team of people who work on this, uh, and it's really exciting for me to be involved. Thank you. In the course of a year, substantial muscle atrophication ought to take place. The first individual you mentioned did not look like he had very strong muscles. How long does it take to overcome that deficit? Uh, about three or four months to, to really get up. And so within um, four months, he had actually gained three inches of, of girth on his legs. Uh, and, and so, in fact, it's a funny story. Um, so about s seven months after... Uh, he, he was in the clinic for the first year. He wanted to go home and see his family in Oregon. And so he went to the airport on his wheelchair, of course, because he's paralyzed, when the array's not turned on. And he can't walk on his own yet. Um, he can only, in a clinical setting, walk, but stand on his own. And so he, he went up to the gate and, um, you know, like, okay, can you help me get to my seat? And, like, the, the um, flight attendant just said, okay, you get up and walk to the seat, and I'll bring the chair to you. Because uh, he's just so muscular now in his lower legs, he doesn't look paralyzed. Other questions? So are you watching what's happening at the injury site now? It seems like you would expect developments along the, the site of the injury. Yeah, no, a that's a great question. Point. And so um, at the moment, there's no good um, technology that can give us a fine enough resolution as to what's happening in there. And so the best we can do right now is to work on animal models of that. And so you know, we try to do uh, a, you know, parallel studies with animal models. And a funny thing, actually, with Rob, when he started gaining voluntary control, every time before he made an advance, he reported to us tingling sensations, actually, at the site of his injury. Um, the other patients had voluntary control immediate, you know, very quickly. So we know it wasn't neural regrowth for them, that we were just facilitating connections that were lying dormant there. You weren't, you weren't worried about additional. No, no, it's obviously a concern. And so one of the things I work on with the home training devices is we've sort of, even though they look very simple, we've actually thought through every possible way they can fail and everything we've seen in the clinic, and we have some way to catch them and, and to make them safe when they fall. But no, it's a huge concern. And, and it's a, the thing is, when every patient, when I first bring the, tr the frame to them so they can try it before we send them home with the frame, they're really nervous. It takes like a couple hours for them to get comfortable because of that exact issue that's like, what if I fall? So you have to convince them that every way they can fall, that they're actually going to be caught. It's a huge issue. As you mentioned, uh, a broken nerve in a, uh, your hand was going to grow together. Years ago, I was told that the problem in the spinal column was that uh, fats and so forth that interfere so that the, the reconnection couldn't occur. Well, like I said, I, I'm no expert in this area, but um, you know, the central nervous system, just the genetic machinery is not set up, so when there's injury, it, it's not, there's no genes that are switched on to enforce neural regrowth. They just tend to actually uh, get uh, inflammatory responses and die instead. Why that is, I, you know, it's not my specialty. Actually, I think this woman in the front here was long-suffering and waiting for her hand to go up. 
Okay, uh, you mentioned uh, simulation and various models. Were they very useful to your research? And what program did you use? Yeah, um, so we, we didn't want to write a Maxwell's equation from scratch. So there's a standard program there called Comsol, it's a multi-physics simulator, um, and they've been helpful in the sense of building intuition. They've been helpful in the sense of excluding certain possibilities. I mean, it's still very mysterious to us exactly how this technique works. Uh, and quite frankly, the lower spinal cord is a backwater in terms of neuroscience. There's a surprising number of things that are unknown down there. So it also helps us generate hypotheses. Um, the thing which is turning out to be quite helpful for us is suggesting ways in which we can modify the shape of the waveforms to um, improve performance and to excite different control modalities on there. But it, it has a lot of limitations. Much for uh, optimization of, of your techniques. <coughs> We're, we're only just now starting on the optimization of how to use these models and to optimize the design of the electrodes. At the moment, it's much more of a let's try a new design and see what happens. Uh, and because um, the combinatorial optimization is a huge, it's, it's a, a huge computational complexity. Given the improvement in quality of life, I was just thinking moving the legs so you don't get bed sores, I mean, and, and all the other things <coughs> that you mentioned, you must have a waiting list that's just crazy long. Yeah, and I noticed uh, that all your, the people that you picked were kind of former athletes, they're, young, they're healthy, all, otherwise healthy people. Yeah, they were, they were reasonably healthy, and that was part of our protocol and, and our agreement with the government, as we figured, because this is so unknown, we wanted to find subjects that had two characteristics. First, actually, they were profiled for psychological profile. So we had to make sure that if we implanted and it didn't work, that they wouldn't be super depressed about it. Second was strong health, because we just didn't know what we were getting into. And, and so what I can say is uh, one of our subjects was already in his mid-30s, um, so, and all these subjects were at least two years post-injury. So there's hope that actually it doesn't have to work right after an injury. It actually can treat people who have been quite distant from their injury. So is there any uh, possibility, are you expanding it now? Because I'm just, yeah, just yeah, Yes, and, and so um, it's very expensive, so we're trying to raise the money as part of it. Um, so I'm not involved in this, but there's going to be a new human study in Louisville, particularly looking at the cardiac and the respiratory and the bladder um, and bowel control issues. And so that now also part of that cohort would be much older. So these are people who may not be able to do all the physical training, but might benefit otherwise. As I said, at UCLA now, we, we have an upper body study, so we only have one human so far, but we're recruiting more. We have enough funds to do about five. Um, and then um, we're also using this external electro technology. We're really excited about it, and those experiments are really cheap. Uh, and so we're uh, trying to accelerate the pace that we can do a large study very soon. Um, there have been a number of uh, reports um, about uh, using brain waves with appropriate algorithms to control external devices. Yeah, that I won't. worked in that field for 10 years. Um, yeah. yep. So um, what would be the, um, of the two types of approaches to improving mobility, um, which do you think has the best success? And um, in other words, if you were to put your money on one or the other, uh, where would, you know, what would you so, so uh, you know, you have to be an optimist to be in this game. And so I'm optimistic that with enough time and money, we'll solve all these problems. And so the question is, which one is more useful in the short term? Uh, you know, I'm biased, right? That's actually why I switched out of the brain one into, into this one. So I think what we're trying to do is to, rather than bypass the broken nervous system, is to work with what's left. Uh, and then, um, even though we've been not looking at stem cells and other things, um, that's actually on our roadmap because it's naive to think that you're going to take some 18-year-old from a, a, you know, a car wreck, bring him into the surgery room, snip out the bad cord, inject stem cells, and they're going to walk away. It's just not going to happen. Uh, so you're going to need technology like this to actually work with that to help in the remodeling process of all the neurons. So uh, an easy thing to say, though, is there's going to be no one magic silver bullet for spinal cord injury. Uh, just because each injury is different, people are different, and, and so we need a whole host of technologies. This is just one of them. It's not the, you know, the ultimate solution, but we think it's going to play an important role in whatever solution comes down the road. Uh, so you mentioned uh, working with what's left, um, and most of your technology seems to be centered on like stimulating the dormant connections that are still in the spinal cord. What well, if you actually, have people uh, that we're, are, What sorry. we're doing is we're, um, stimulating the circuitry down there. And what mm -hmm. we found, we never anticipated, is that somehow some of the dormant connections coming down the cord. So 
um, even in a severely damaged cord, we know there's a little bit of core remnants left there. Um, it's just that normally they can't pass enough signal to be useful down there. Now that we're exciting the circuitry down there, even the little bit of signal that gets down there can actually activate some things. So then what if you had patients that were like those rats where they, there's literally a block in the spinal cord and no signal can pass through? Yeah, yeah, and so um, what we believe is, especially when the first patients first get going, they don't know how to use their voluntary control. So all their standing ability actually is not using any of the dormant connections. That's actually just completely triggered externally. And, and so even with the most severe injury, we believe, uh, unless there's other health conditions, that we can at least get them to stand. Um, now, they may not be able to do much more than that. Thanks. In aid of finding um, cheaper patients on which to work. Have you gone back to trying this on robots? On? Robots. Uh, well, I mean, I still work with robots, and actually I'm involved now. Some of you may know is there's a big national competition that DARPA is sponsoring called the Robotics Challenge, where there's teams of uh, robots that are working in the Fukushima disaster-like scenario. So I'm one of the teams with JPL. Uh, and, and so we're doing lots of locomotion work there. But what's really different is that the te technology you have available is, is quite different. So the technology substrate we work with is different. Um, and so the human one's way more complicated. Uh, and there's a whole host of other sort of issues than just the pure technology issues you have to deal with in terms of health, psychology, everything else. Have you been with humans trying to fight back not, not with me yet, but I hope so someday. Any other questions? So the four patients you have with the spinal stimulators, is there motivation to keep doing the training standing every day to keep up the changes with the bowel and bladder temperature and things, or is there motivation, um, I'm going to walk again? I mean, are they doing it more just because their quality of life has improved with um, the There's no thing? doubt that all of them, it's the quality of life. So in fact, with Rob, our first patient, our protocol with the government was to take the electrode out after one year. And he said, the hell you will. Um, <laughs> and so we had to go back and rewrite the protocol with the government. So now they have to come back to the clinic every roughly three to four months for a checkup. Um, and, and so, and the thing is, no one wants to try giving it up to see, and see, hope that they won't lose anything, right? Uh, and um, because they can do the exercise now, um, you know, they can just, just like, you know, normal healthy adults, you want to do exercise. So it allows them to do things they just couldn't do before. So it, again, it allows them to manage their health in a way that they couldn't do otherwise. It, it seems like there's a great opportunity to use fMRI technology right here to understand those connections that are dormant or latent that don't, aren't quite able to communicate through. Yeah, if you can get me, if you can get the voxel size down to 10 microns, uh, it'll help me. But you know, you know, you're still, you know, the community is still off by a factor of 10. So that means you cannot image what's going on in the spinal cord with enough fidelity, not necessarily to map the electrode, but just understand what kind of communication the brain is attempting to do across that damaged section. No. Um, not at the present. So that, that could easily change. But um, there are all alternative ways. And so um, we're again waiting for government approval and funds um, to do some you know, uh, neural conduction tests and other kinds of things to see if we can start to tease apart what's happening. Because one of the big exciting finds that we never anticipated was the recovery of some voluntary motion and voluntary control. So obviously you'd like to accentuate that. Well, first we have to understand how it works before we can even then try to optimize it. And so we're still struggling with that. Um, I, we haven't tried it with these particular patients, but I actually have an interesting story. So uh, my next door neighbor has a friend that I see quite often who was hit by a car. It's a woman and it went by 20 years ago, and over time she's in effect nearly paralyzed now because um, she has severe damage to her hips and bones and things. And so for her, the segue has been a lifesaver um, because she can't really stand with her crutches for a long period at a cocktail party, and that's always when I see her. Um, and, and so um, she'll stand for a little while, and then she'll get in the segue, and there's a small community that rehabs these segues for um, dis disabled people, and so they have a special seat so she can sit on there and actually be high enough to be engaged in a conversation and get around and not get super tired. So I can tell you for a certain community out there, it's been a lifesaver. Can this technology be uh, related to people who suffer from a stroke? Uh, 
Yeah, I said we're doing some stroke studies right now. Um, and so, in fact, actually, I, I was over at UCLA about a month ago working with a stroke patient using this external electrode technology. So uh, we haven't had a large enough long duration study for me to give you definitive answers. Everything I tell you is only anecdotal right now, and I want to stress there's no deep scientific numbers behind what I'm going to say. It clearly does have an effect, and it seems to be a significant effect. It's not going to be all strokes. Um, and um, so there's certain kind of strokes where we just won't be able to help, and there's certain strokes that other techniques will be better than what we're going to do. But um, we have found for a small number of stroke patients that actually it helps their recovery. Uh, it it um, speeds their recovery um, and allows them to get a greater range of motion than they would otherwise. But the numbers are very small, and it hasn't been a very long duration study yet. And, and so one of the things my colleague Reggie's working on right now is actually a stroke model. So the classical model for strokes, it's absurd, but it actually is to cut the spinal cord, which isn't really a stroke, but that's the closest they can do. So he's working with Dan Liu, whose name I had up there before, uh, and a team of, of chemists to try to figure out a way to induce selectively strokes in certain brain areas in primate models so they can then study it. Can you talk a little bit about the stimulation patterns, what you've learned about why they work and how they work? What's the difference? You know, you said you had one that's symmetric or asymmetric. Um, yeah, um, what so, do we know about stimulation patterns? Yeah, um, so there's a couple of things. Each person's injury can be a little bit different in the humans, and also when you place these arrays, so at first you place them surgically, but using preoperative um, uh, MRI studies, and then in the surgery room, um, you actually do a little electrophysiology. So while there are patients asleep, you basically turn the stimulator on, and we've discovered patterns over years that will stimulate individual muscles, so we can then fine tune it. But after you close it, sometimes it shifts a little bit. And so part of the asymmetry is having to do with the array placement. Part of it's having to do with their specific injury. Um, the other thing is um, we've, where we've chosen is where we believe the locomotor circuitry is, but there's a bunch of other circuitry mixed in there also. And, and so um, lower down on the cord, the biologists call it caudal, tends to be more for standing. Um, and upper, a little bit middle, tends to be for stepping, and up high tends to be closer to abdominal. So with Rob, we started out initially with uh, really high ones, and he'd get up there and he'd go, ah, 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 and you know, you're like, Rob, you're okay? Said, yes, I'm okay. Um, you know, this guy is an elite athlete; he could put up with anything. Um, and you know, we would knock the wind out of them um, sometimes by you know hitting too high. So we tend to actually what's called guard. Um, so we tend to choose electrode patterns that guard against that abdominal, you know. Um, contraction when we don't want it, but actually it was a lucky find because now they can use it for the setup times as well, right? So um, we've had lots of lucky finds. Um, you know, I got to say, it, it's, we've had more luck than smarts. Um, that's absolutely spectacular. Yeah, <laughs> that's um, very impressed. Thank you. And, and so, but like I said, it just you know, um, the other thing is um, there's different frequencies. So lower frequencies tend to be more around 20 hertz for standing. Um, stepping tends to be higher around 35 hertz. Why that is. Uh, you know, we have a few conjectures. We're trying to model it. We're trying to understand it better. We just don't know. Okay, I think that's our last question. I want to thank Dr. Burdick for being here this afternoon. Thank you.